Sai Ram. You're listening to Sai Soul 100, a weekly podcast series with soul, or stories of unconditional love, shared by devotees of Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba in celebration of his 100th birthday. We invite you to listen in on these motivational stories of his constant loving presence in devotees' lives. Offered at his lotus feet by the Sri Satya Sai International Organization USA, Mid Atlantic Region. Welcome to Sai Soul 100. Sai Ram, dear listeners, welcome to Sai Soul 100. Our guest today is Brother Vladimir Gurevich, who is joining us from Fairlawn, New Jersey. He will be sharing a story of how Swami took him from the lowest point in life to the absolute highest within moments. Sairam, Brother Vladimir, welcome to Sai Soul 100. Sairam, happy to be here. Thank you. We are looking forward to hearing your story. Please go ahead. So it started, uh, I think, in 1981. Uh, I was working at the bank. Uh, as a consultant, and I was working with a devotee from Long Island, Mark Schles. And Mark Schles had uh, a picture of Swami above his desk, a black and white picture of young Swami above his desk. And I was looking for a teacher. I wanted to find a spiritual teacher. So I asked you know, Mark about uh, who that was. And Mark, Mark uh, has been to India already by that time. And he described to me darshan, what darshan is. And of course, I imagine it completely different from what it was. But anyway, uh, that's how I found out about Swami. And at the same time, I remember I wasn't uh, uh, feeling very well. I wanted to find something for, for my mind and for my body, some, something, some kind of exercise. And Mark recommended a Tai Chi teacher who was a devotee of Swami too. So I started, uh, I went to uh, a demonstration of Tai Chi. I loved it from the first sight. And I started practicing Tai Chi. I started you know, coming to classes and that was around 1981. Uh, my teacher, my Tai Chi teacher, by that time already wrote a book about Tai Chi. He dedicated it to Swami. He brought it to the ashram. Swami blessed it. It was before I I met him. And I remember my teacher told us that uh, Swami took the manuscript, put it in a windowsill. And uh, my teacher, like a few moments later, a few minutes later, my teacher looked at the window and the manuscript was gone. Wow. That was my introduction to magic. So anyway, I started practicing Tai Chi. I really loved it. And I started reading everything about Tai Chi. And Tai Chi, they were saying that Tai Chi was kind of expression of Chinese philosophy of Taoism. So I read everything on Taoism, read the complete work of Lao Tzu, and everything I could find. And of course, I read the book by my teacher. In the book, he described the experience he had while practicing Zen. And the experience reminded me of the experiences I used to have when I was a child. I used to have some experiences practically daily at the age of four, five, six. And I wanted to find the explanation what it was. So I thought because the experience my teacher described in his book kind of reminded me of what I had when I was a child. So I decided to start looking for a Zen teacher. And I found a Zen community in New York, which was basically a Zen seminary with a few uh, permanent monks there. Uh, And it was functioning, basically functioning in a small Zen monastery in a way. Uh, I started going there, I received initial instructions in, in meditation. Before that, I never had any kind of formal instructions. I received these instructions and I went uh, for a couple of weekend retreats. When you sit, uh, it's basically a weekend, like almost two days, a day and a half. Starts uh, Friday night, the whole day Saturday, and then half a day on Sunday. Uh, So that was your formal introduction uh, into that Zen sitting. I met Zen master. 
uh, he gave me my initial koan in, in Zen tradition. This is called a koan, uh, which is basically uh, a riddle which doesn't have any intellectual solutions. I'm sure you've heard something like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Or, I'm sorry, can you say that again? What, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Okay. Or if the, if the tree fell in the forest and no one was there to witness that, was there a sound? Oh. This is the kind of riddles are given to the practitioners. These riddles don't have intellectual solution. And there are more and more complex riddles like that. And the whole idea here is to short circuit the mind and to find the solution with something else, some other faculty. That's basically the small openings towards the enlightenment. The enlightenment is the full opening. And these little steps are the small steps towards that final culmination. And all the practitioners are sitting with riddles like that. They're given these riddles by the master and everybody's practicing what they're given. So during my first uh, interviews with Swami, as a matter of fact, believe it or not, my very first question to my Zen master was about Swami. But that's, that's a different story. He came from from Los Angeles, and he knew about Swami. We talked a little bit about it. Um, and so he gave me my first cone, and I started practicing. He that, gave and you I your first code? It's called koan. K-O-A-N, koan. K -O -A -N, koan. That's okay. a Japanese word, for, and it's translated like public case. That's the translation for it. But it's basically one of these riddles. Since I was the beginning, I was given the very first simple koan. Um, and it was basically one word. I had to practice. I had to concentrate on one word only. Basically very similar to OM. But in my particular case, it was the sound of MU, MU. The word MU in Japanese means not. But there was, there was a whole story behind that. It wasn't just, just yeah, a random word. There was a story behind that originated with a Zen master who lived almost 1,500 years ago. We still consider it one of the highest, the best Zen masters of all times. A Chinese, as a matter of fact, he was Chinese. And all of that happened in, in China. The word Zen, by the way, the word Zen comes from the word Yana. When Buddhism migrated from India to China, Dhyana became Chan. So in China, it's called Chan Buddhism. And then it, when it migrated to J Japan, it became Zen Buddhism. But it's basically the same word. It's Dhyana, Chan, and Zen. Dhyana. Zen. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that uh, Chinese uh, Zen master originated that koan more than a thousand years ago. And it was given to me, and I started practicing it. I think I started practicing it at home right away started sitting, and I continued sitting for all these 40 years. The Zen master was so powerful that he inspired me to do that. Um, so I attended a couple of retreats, we weekend retreats, uh, and it was okay. Everything was fine. I loved it. Um, and I continued practicing at home, but I wanted to see Swami. At the same time, I knew about Swami already. I read a couple of books. By that time, we're talking about probably 1981, 82. Uh, there were very few books on Swami. I think I probably read the first Murphy's book and the first Sam Sandwise's book. And that was it by that time. Uh, so I wanted to go to India, but I didn't know how to get there. I was a little scared, of course. Um, and I decided since I was reading everything about Taoism and Tai Chi and Chinese tradition, there is uh, a book called I Ching. I Ching. And it's can you called spell the book. Can you, are you able to spell it's, that? For uh, me? The word I. Yes. And then dash ching. C H I N G. I okay. Ching. I Ching. I still have it at home. Uh, it's called the Book of Divination. It's basically like different verses. And there is a method in that ancient China, they used to uh, use sticks to find out which verse you have to read, which will answer your questions. And in modern times, we can use coins. Yes. And I read somewhere how to use coins and how to, to arrive at the verse you're supposed to uh, 
to read and which will answer your questions. So I decided since I was struggling with this you know, question, should I go to India? I wanted to see Swami. So I decided to use this book. Uh, so I used coins. Uh, it came uh, to verse number 64. I still remember. In that book, the verse number 64 was supposed to answer my question. So I went to the book and the verse number 64 said, it does not further one to, cr to cross the great waters, but it does further one to see a great man. So the first part, it does not further one to cross the great waters, basically told me I'm not going to India. Okay. The second part, but it does further one to see a great man, started looking for a great man around, and I couldn't find anybody except Zen master. And I knew by that time, I already said this, you know, two weekend retreats and just observing him, I knew that he is deeply enlightened. You could basically sense it. He was so different. And of course I had interactions with him. So I decided to join a week, week long retreat. Okay. Before I attended only two weekend retreats, but now I decided to attend a week long retreat. So I took a vacation at work, uh, packed my suitcase. I remember I went to the suitcase uh, to the Zen community, and now I'm there. Uh, and uh, it started uh, Sunday night. I don't remember if, if we said uh, Sunday night, but you know, in earnest, really formally, it starts Monday morning. And on Monday morning, we start sitting. Uh, the whole routine uh, is basically, you basically sit the whole day. You sit the whole day long, not in one, one shot, of course. It's like different intervals. Okay. Uh, usually the longest period is after breakfast, it's two and a half hours. But again, you don't sit the, the straight uh, two and a half hours because nobody will be able uh, to manage that. It's broken into small intervals. You sit for 25 minutes, then you get up, and you do walking meditation. Uh, there was enough space to go and we would walk for five minutes and then go back and sit, and you go back to our cushions and sit for another 25 minutes, then another five minutes, and that's how it goes. Uh, and of course, there are yeah, periods of, uh, of meals uh, and there is a little break uh, after lunch, there is uh, a break, but basically the whole day uh, you sit. So it started on Monday, and uh, everything was fine on the first day. Everything was fine on the second day. By the end of the third day, on Wednesday night, the pain in my body from sitting was unbearable. Yeah. Absolutely unbearable. I have to make a little di digression and say that around 10 years before, when I was um, around 20 years old, I developed a disease which is very similar to juvenile arthritis. Okay. Uh, it affected joints and it affected uh, my, my eye. Basically, it started with an eye and nobody knew. I was in and out of the hospitals. Nobody knew what was going on for approximately half a year until I developed pain in my, in my joints. And then they realized that's what it is. I was uh, treated. Um, a very long story, but the bottom line, I, I was told that my life is basically movement. I have to move. Okay. I have to move all the times. Otherwise, my joints will stiffen and freeze. And uh, I, I had to sleep um, on wooden planks. I basically I built uh, myself a bed at that time. I slept on wood, no, nothing uh, soft. And I had to do a special gymnastics. Every morning I had to do special gymnastics before getting out of bed. Um, and I was doing it for approximately 10 years. By the time I was in the community, all of this was already gone. I wasn't doing that gymnastics and I wasn't sleeping on wood. I was sleeping okay. on a regular bed. So now we are at the end of the third day. The last sitting period is from 7.30 p.m. till 9 p.m. The pain in my body was so bad that my whole body was shaking, literally shaking with pain because mm -hmm. my, my life is movement. And here I was frozen for three days. I was sitting basically without, 
Uh, of course, yeah, I was working and yeah, there were meals and all kinds of stuff, but it was still too much. And I remember I was counting seconds, literally seconds, not minutes, seconds till the end of that period. Yeah. I survived. I survived. I lasted till, till the end. So now next morning, before getting up from my mattress in, in the basement of the Zen community, I decided I'm going to do these exercises, which I was taught years ago, just to loosen my bones, because my bones were freezing, and that was new bones and, of course, muscles from sitting uh, this long. Uh, it was, you know, everything was in pain. So I thought maybe I will do these exercises, and I was doing these exercises for so many years. I remember some, you know, a few of them. And before getting up from my mattress, I decided, let me do some of these exercises. And one of these exercises is pulling your knees very hard. It's basically a regular near yoga. There are exercises like that in yoga. You pull your knees very hard towards your chest. And you do one knee at a time, basically to loosen the, the pelvic, uh, pelvic joints. So I did this exercise. I got up. Went uh, uh, to shower, then the service, you know, we're getting up very early. The service is at five o'clock in the morning. I went through service, and then the first period of sitting is from 5.30 in the morning till seven. So I'm sitting down. The meditation hall is called Zenda. So everybody, there were a lot of people. It was filled to the brim. And I remember before the retreat, you would see all these people coming for this retreat, people were driving from very long distances. In those days, there were very few Zen masters. So for some serious practitioners, it was a very unusual chance to be there and to practice. Uh, in the Zenda, the silence is pin drop. Normally, it's a pin drop silence. It's, uh, the Zenda is completely soundproof. No sound penetrates from, from outside. So at 5.30 in the morning, we're all sitting down, approximately 60 people. No free cushions there. Every cushion is taken. It's just we're sitting one next to each other on a like, big um, black cushion. And uh, the first period starts. And all of a sudden, I hear that my stomach starts rumbling, just making some sounds. And I have to tell you that the discipline there is really, really like Japanese style. If somebody during these periods, the sitting periods, will make slightest adjustment to their body, slightest adjustment, one of the head monks would scream at the top of his lungs, no fidgeting. During meals, and we would sit like you know, along you know, the long table, uh, we would sit and eat in silence, no eye contact, no talking, nothing. If somebody's spoon will touch the bottom of the bowl, by chance, the head monk would scream at the top of his lungs, silence! Wow. So you can imagine the intimidation and, and the whole, the whole uh, atm atmosphere there. So in the Zenda, it's like, Total, total pin drop silence. And all of a sudden I hear that my stomach started growling. And then I realized, oh my God, this was probably from this very vigorous exercise I've done just maybe an hour ago. Mm -hmm. During service time, because you know, there's a lot of chanting, I didn't hear any of this. And maybe it was waiting, my stomach was waiting to, to set me up when there was total pin drop silence. So here my stomach started growling. And I think, oh, it will go away. Like in a few minutes, in a few seconds, it will go away. But it doesn't go away. It keeps growling and growling and rumbling. And I think, oh my God, what can I do? Start pulling my stomach in, starting holding my breath. I tried absolutely everything I could. Nothing helps. Instead, it's getting louder and basically constant, constant rumbling in my stomach. And I know that every single person in that meditation hall listens to that and hears that. 
Mm-hmm. And instead of concentrating on there, because everybody is there for a purpose, this is serious people basically uh, determined to attain enlightenment because everything about me in Zen is you have to attain enlightenment. And all the discourses of the master and all the, all the writings is all about one thing. You have to attain enlightenment. This is the goal. You have to get there any way you, you can. So everybody's struggling, everybody's striving, concentrating, and all of a sudden my stomach is rumbling and rumbling and rumbling and it's getting louder and louder and louder and I'm getting more and more desperate. And I don't know what to do. The most sensible thing to do probably at that point would have been just to get up and walk out of this meditation hall. But nobody has done that before. The discipline is so strict there that I was literally terrified. I didn't know what to do. So I'm slowly sinking into this lowest point of of my life. It's like me. Literally, I felt I'm in this abyss. And I didn't know what to do. And at that lowest point of my life, at the last moment, I remembered Swami. Mm. I haven't been to India yet. This is 1981 or 82. I went to India for the first time in 84. I read only a couple of books. I didn't know of any of this new esoteric mantras like Om Sai Ram, J Sai Ram, Gayatri, nothing. I knew nothing about any of this. I just read a couple of books. And the only thing I knew, Sai Baba. And that, at that lowest moment of my life, I started calling on Sai Baba. Mm. Sai Baba, Sai Baba. By that time, I already sat for three days. That's, that's pretty powerful. It's basically my body was stable. My mind was stable. I had few very powerful interviews with the Zen master. He basically like injects you with this energy, with this focus, concentration. So in a way, I was primed. The only thing I needed was the intensity. And that despair, that predicament I found myself in, gave me that intensity. And I started calling on Sai Baba. What I remember is... Every single cell of my body was calling on Sai Baba. There was not a single thought in my mind except his name. Mm. Everything slowly, slowly, slowly was, in a way, I was kind of sinking in that name. There was nothing else. Like the world basically disappeared. There was nothing else except that name. And I was calling Sai Baba, Sai Baba, Sai Baba. I don't know, maybe it was for a minute, maybe for two minutes. And all of a sudden, I start feeling that I'm growing. And the first thing I remember, I became as big as that whole Zenda, the whole meditation hall. Then I became as big as the whole castle, the whole house where we sat. And I became as big as the whole neighborhood. Then as big as the whole city. But I continue to grow. I became as big as the whole country. Then as big as the whole continent. But I continue to grow. I became as big as the whole planet Earth. But I continue to grow. When I stopped growing, I was holding this whole planet Earth in the palms of my hand. Uh, You know that Swami said there are three different mudras, and the best mudra is to, when you meditate, to keep one palm on top of the other, and thumbs slightly touching, and that's how they sit in Zen, and that's how you would see uh, when Buddha is depicted in all the statues or pictures, he's usually sitting like that. So in Zen, we were sitting like that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of this whole, um whole experience i was holding this whole planet earth in the palms of my hand right in that ball which you form when you sit and i was in that state for some time i'm sure it wasn't very long i'm sure it didn't last 
across different periods of settings. I'm sure it was still within this 25 minutes. I have no idea how long it lasted because you know, there is no time then. When I came back to my normal consciousness, I don't remember what was happening with my stomach. Literally don't remember. It just wasn't important at that time. I was so overwhelmed by that experience because it was a very real experience. I felt myself, whatever it is, not my body, but me, that big, holding this whole planet Earth in, my, in the palms of my hand. And uh, it was just so overwhelming and maybe shocking that I didn't even mention it to, to the Zen master. Just I didn't even know where to start and how to describe it. it probably take 20 minutes to describe it to him, <laughs> like now. Uh, uh, and the interviews are usually very short because a lot of people want to see him. So I never mentioned it to him. It would be interesting, of course, to know how he yeah, categorized that, that experience, what he would say about that. But to me, uh, over the years when I looked at it, I thought maybe that was Swami gave me the experience of expanded consciousness and gave me the experience that who I am. I'm not this little body. I'm definitely not this little mind. I am much bigger. And that's exactly what Swami is teaching. How many times Swami said, you're not the body, you're not the mind, you're something else, you're Atma. Maybe I had a glimpse of that Atma. Uh, but that's, that's basically where it stands. Uh, I, I feel that maybe Swami set me up for that. So I experience who I am. And uh, especially now, this um, experience is very pertinent because we just finished uh, studying Upanishad Vahini. Mm. And in one of the uh, Vahinis, one section is called Expand Your Consciousness for Liberation. One of the sections called Expand Your Consciousness for Liberation. And I saved it in my email. I, I have it you know, on, on the first screen of my email. So I, I see it each time I log on. I see it and it reminds me. And when I see it in the morning, I try to remember it. And in a way, try to recreate it, try to think of myself, not this little body, but that, that consciousness. Expand that consciousness. Ex yeah. Yes, that expansion. Wow. So, Brother Vladimir, thank you so much for sharing this powerful story of really Swami taking you from the lowest point, lowest of the lowest points to the absolute highest. And for you, for him to give you or allow you to experience this sense of expanded consciousness which we are all searching for and so I was grateful that you were able to feel that and experience that and also remind you cons consistently to um, strive for that so thank you for being here at Sai Soul 100 thank you and Sairam 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 dear listeners thank you for joining Sai Soul 100 with Vladimir Gurevich I am Prabha Swaminathan until next time, Jay Sai Ram.